Welcome to Simplify. I'm Ben Schumann Stoller. And I'm Caitlin Schiller. Simplify is for anybody who's taken a closer look at their habits, their happiness, their relationships, or their health and thought, there's got to be a better way to do this. In today's episode, Caitlin talks to Michael Bungay Stinier, coach and listener. I have to say, I'm not the biggest consumer of management leadership coaching books. But when I like when I hear coaching, I think of Arsene Wenger or Phil Jackson. But um, I read Stinier's book, The Coaching Habit, a few years back, and I have to say it really, really stuck with me. I'm really glad to hear that because I, I really enjoyed the conversation. I think that'll stick with me too. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how it is for everybody, but for me, the leaders that I really have enjoyed working with over my career, I guess, is they're, they're teachers, they're cheerleaders. They make me better. Yeah. Well, being able to ask the right questions, whether that's in the role of a teacher or a leader or just to cheer you on, is such a powerful thing. Yeah. And it's it's actually, I think this is a really good topic for Simplify because there are so many books out there about this. And I'm really excited for today because I think you guys in the interview, you, you take us through coaching, you simplify coaching via a few questions and approaches. Exactly. And Michael has this really smooth approach. You can tell that he's built his coaching systems at his organization, which is called Box of Crayons, by the way, over many years and lots of iterations. And it's really cool to see the effect they have on you, actually. <laughs> right. He's a little, a little ninja coaching on me. <laughs> All right. So let's get into it. Don't forget to stick around after the interview because we will make a book list for anybody who wants to go deeper into coaching and more. All right, then. Here's Caitlin Schiller and Michael Bungay Stinier. Hi, Michael. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Could you introduce yourself, please? Sure. So I am Michael Bungay Stenier. I am the founder and, I guess, CEO of Box of Crayons, which is a training company based in Toronto where we teach 10-minute coaching so busy managers can lead stronger teams and have better results. I'm also the author of a bunch of books. Uh, the most recent and the one that's done the best is called The Coaching Habit, Say Less, Ask More, and Change the Way You Lead Forever. And I've got a bunch of other things out there as well. Great. Thank you. So um, to start us off, what's on your mind? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I know what I know what you're doing there, and for what it's worth, you're not the first person who's done that. But no. that's good. And, and, for the, and for the folks who are listening in and going, what what are they talking about? Um, the the coaching habit book has it says, look, here are the seven questions you need to be more coach like, more effective as a manager and leader. Mm -hmm. And the very first one is what's on your mind. So perfect. <laughs> okay, so then let's just dive right into it. What is a coaching habit? Why? How is coaching applicable in business and not on a basketball court? Can you just talk a little bit about that? Sure. So uh, it's a great question because it's already drawing distinctions and pointing to one of the key challenges about this, this kind of conversation about coaching, which is everybody's heard of coaching, but there's like a thousand different versions of it. There's life coaching, there's sport coaching, there's executive coaching. Um, but our focus, and my focus, I guess, is actually supporting people who are managers, who are leaders, who are doing their best to run a team or just work and engage with people around them. And in my context, in that particular context, coaching is a leadership tool. It's a leadership behavior. And what it means to me, the, the snappiest definition I've got for it is simply, can you stay curious a little bit longer and can you rush to action and advice giving just a little bit more slowly? Mm. So curious longer, action and advice giving more slowly. Because it turns out that most people are advice giving maniacs. Like they, they love to tell people what to do. And it also turns out that, in general, advice giving is an overdeveloped and less effective way of managing and leading than hmm. you might think. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, there's a number of different things. The, I mean, honestly, there's times when advice giving is exactly the right thing to do. I mean, Caitlin, if you come into my, you know, my office, virtual office, and go, hey, Michael, where do I find the, the file? It's terrible for me to go, so, Caitlin, how are you feeling about the file? And, <laughs> You know, that's that's not useful. So, you know, it's important people hear that I'm not saying never give advice. But here's why you should move to advice giving more slowly. The first is most of the time you don't really know what the challenge is. Uh, we get mm. seduced into thinking that the first thing somebody tells you is the real challenge and the thing that needs to be solved. So you're too quickly solving the the wrong challenge. Secondly, honestly, people's advice isn't nearly as good as they think it is. So mm. often now you're offering up slightly crappy advice to solve the wrong problem. 
And thirdly, even if you've got the right problem and your advice is amazing, there's a dynamic that's playing out, which is you're, you're training the people you're leading and managing and influencing to come to you for advice. Mm -hmm. rather than helping them become more self-sufficient, more confident, more competent, more capable, more able to work by themselves. Mm, okay, so it's creating a, a more self-sufficient minion, basically, who is not a minion at all, but a, but a self-sustaining force who makes good decisions. Um, you know, yeah. 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 Can we go back to that question, the very first question that I asked you, which yeah. was pretty loaded? Um, what's on your mind? Why, why is that such a good question to start a coaching session with? Right. So our belief is that uh, in organizational life, if you can't coach somebody in 10 minutes or less, you probably don't have time to coach. Because there's a lot of research out there that says one of the big barriers to people being more coach-like is that they're like, have you seen my inbox? Have you seen my meeting schedule? Have you seen my to-do list? Who has time for this coaching stuff? Hmm. And the answer is none of us do. Not if you think that coaching is a kind of formal sit down, let's have a 45 minute conversation about your life. You know, typically, we don't have time to be able to do that consistently and regularly and effectively with the people with whom we work. So if you if you buy into this, if you buy into this fact that if coaching is going to work, it has to be fast, and it has to be an everyday part of how you work, then you've got to figure out how to get into the interesting conversations more quickly. And I bet most of the folks listening here have been in those conversations where you know, you really want to help, but you're 20 minutes into the conversation. You're like, ah, are we, what are we talking about? You know, where's, where's the juice here? You want to get into the juice of the conversation fast. And what's on your mind has a, a couple of things to make it work. The first is you're giving them the choice. And rather than you rushing in to do the thing, fix the thing, suggest the thing, you're saying you do the work here. So that's the first part of it. But you're not saying to them, okay, talk to me about anything. You're saying, tell me, talk to me. Let's get a conversation about the thing that is most exciting for you or most worrying for you or most waking you up at four o'clock in the morning for you. Let's go there. If you go, look, I know you're doing a lot, but of everything that you're tackling at the moment, what's on your mind? And I can promise you, mm. you're going to get into a more interesting conversation much more quickly. Hmm. It seems to me that that's a really vulnerable conversation, or that the question can open it into a really vulnerable place. Yeah, it could. But what's nice about this is that the person on the other on the receiving end of the question has the choice about what they talk about. Mm -hmm. You're like, what's on your mind? And you give them the choice to go where they want to go. Now, what you hope as a leader is that as as the relationship develops, as they build trust, as you build intimacy, they're more and more willing to talk about the stuff that might be more and more vulnerable for them. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so there's a lot of research out there that says that we need time to really make a change. And anecdotally, people who do it for a living often say that the best interviews happen when you have time to let the conversation kind of flow and find its own organic paths. And then... Even from a psychological standpoint, attachment theory would dictate that you need time to be with a coachee in order to really gain their trust and let you change them. So then my question, given all of this, is 10 minutes really enough? Um, that's a really nice question. And the answer is, if it was a one-off 10-minute conversation, probably not. Hmm. But the three principles that we have around our approach to coaching are these. Be lazy, be curious, be often. Now, be lazy which we've kind of hinted at, which is stop doing all the work for them. <laughs> stop, mm -hmm. stop jumping in and fixing it and solving it for them. Let them do that work. Being curious, we've spoken to as well, which is about recognize that you're wired to leap in with advice, suggestions, opinions, solutions, and slow down the rush to give advice. And then be often is to recognize that every interaction can be a bit more coach-like. You remember, be curious a little bit longer, rush to action and advice a little bit more slowly. So, you know, in a conversation, a formal conversation, a walk down the hall conversation, an email and a text or an IM, you can you can lead with curiosity. Hmm. And we're not necessarily asking people to go, OK, now tell me about your traumatic childhood. But we've only got six minutes on this one. So, you know, make it snappy. Mm -hmm. This is mostly about focused on making progress on the work that needs to be done. But 
and this is a bit of coaching jargon, we're, we're trying to think about coaching for performance and coaching for development. Coaching mm-hmm. for performance is kind of getting stuff done. And a big part of the questions are about making progress on the stuff that needs to be worked on. But coaching and development is about developing the person who's doing the stuff. And what you want is both of those things to happen. Mm. And even in a, in a fast conversation, you can help people gain insights about themselves and about the situation that leads to that increase in you know, autonomy, confidence, competence, all of those things we talked about before. Right. So what would you say is the central sort of competency of a person who was a good coach? What are some skills that they need to work on, say, you would need to work on in order to to effectively coach me, or I would need to work on in myself to coach someone else well? What are some things that that some skills people can build? Yeah, you know, it's a a really juicy question. And it's it's an endless quest (laughs) to become better at this. Mm -hmm. But for most people, there are some really basic starting points, which is, can you practice being curious a little bit longer, which I honestly boils down to, look, get three or four or seven questions and make them part of your repertoire, make them part of your day-to-day way of working. And if you do that alone, your progress towards being more coach-like will be immense. Now, once you've got the seven questions and you're like, okay, I'm committed to ask, I don't know, what's on your mind or what's the real challenge here for you or what do you want? Those are all questions from the book then there are things you can refine around that. So like learning how to ask a question more powerfully. You know, it's like stop with the the long lead in to the question. Don't ask 17 questions all at once and kind of shoot the person down by a drive-by questioning incident. Um, (laughs) Actually, once you've asked the question, stop and listen to the answer rather than worry about what the next question is that you should be asking and, and, you know, you're so busy listening to your own head that you, you, you fail to listen to them. Mm-hmm. You know, those are all powerful ways to make sure your questions land and are asked in the most powerful way. But, you know, a starting point is around what are my questions and how can I just build a good habit around asking them? And if you get that down, and I bet you a ton of people listening feel that they have got that down, which is great, then there is always more work to do. Mm. And I reckon there's work in in the big the big things and the small things. The small things are kind of technical. They're about being more precise about your language. They're being more courageous around asking the same question more than once to try and get a deeper answer around that. Mm-hmm. There's ways of how you kind of physically position yourself if you're you know in the same room as the person in terms of having that conversation, which can help. But the deeper things are about you know physician heal thyself. Who am I? What what drives me? How do I increase my presence? How do I increase my compassion? How do I increase my generosity? And that's you know that's the work of a lifetime. Indeed. So you say that you are you're helping people become more coach like. What is what is the opposite of being coach like? What do you see people doing, expending energy on when they want to coach people that they really don't need to be doing? Yeah. Well, the. It's an interesting question, I, and I haven't been asked it quite like that before. I think the opposite of coach-like is, for most of us, business as usual, which is, you know, if you like, not being lazy, not being curious, and not being consistent and persistent around asking questions. So mm-hmm. the opposite of lazy, be lazy, be curious, be often. So, yeah, most of us, because of time pressure, because of training, because of expectation that if you're at this level, you should be the one with the answers, Mm. because of the expectation that the most useful thing I can do is tell the person what they should be doing. We've got some very deep habits that we're trying to shift. And that's why in the book, in fact, uh, Caitlin, we start talking about habits as the first chapter, because Mm -hmm. it's all well and good to know the questions. But as, as many people have said, we typically don't have a knowing problem, we have a doing problem. So that's why we start with this habit piece, because we're like, what we care about here is behavior change, not do you have a list of questions in your head? Uh, okay, so knowing problem versus doing problem is like saying easier said than done? Yeah, okay. exactly. I mean, okay. You know, ask people about coaching, ask people about questions. And you know, a ton of people go, oh, yeah, coaching's good. And oh, yeah, I know some good coaching questions. Mm-hmm. Figure out whether they actually do that. Not so much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
You know what struck me when you were talking about asking these these pretty vulnerable questions? This is from the question a few minutes ago. Yeah. What would you recommend a coach do when they come up against or or they're working with someone who just can't answer or doesn't know how to answer or maybe has never been presented with with this kind yeah. of invitation before? What what sure. do you how do they deal with that? Well, let me ask you, Caitlin, because I've got a, I've got an answer to this, and I'll, I'll share it for sure. But okay, what, what's your instinct? I mean, how would you answer your own question? Mm. <laughs> I would probably think about what that person was doing in their day to day, and yeah. try to give them a few examples and say, "But we don't need to talk about those things. I'm interested in what's most interesting to you right now." And nice assure them that it was a safe place for them to to share that and that I was interested. I might even decide to share what was on my mind if they needed an example. I don't know. Cool. Yeah, they're all good ideas. Let me push you if there's something else you could do. Somebody's coming to you and they're like, they got that wide-eyed look, right? You've asked them a question and they're like, oh, <laughs> I don't know how to deal with that. <laughs> Been there. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. As have we all. Um, what else could you do to to make it easy for them to lean into this? Hmm. Or easier, at least. I might admit to them that I know that this is hard and that I've also been there, but past that, yeah. I'm not I'm not really sure. I think I would share that that I was also feeling uncertain and that I wanted this to go well for, for both of us, and I was interested and cared. Yeah, fantastic. So a ton of great suggestions. Um, and You're so course, affirming. What, what, <laughs> yeah. Well, what I'm doing is I'm just role modeling a couple of coaching habits here. Um, and, and one of them is this, one of the most tempting things to have you move into the advice giving mode mm. is when somebody goes, hey, how do I, just like you asked me, how, when this happens, how do I deal with it? And of course, every part of me goes, oh, this is awesome. I know the answer to this. I'm going to look really smart. So yeah. thank you, Caitlin, for setting me up <laughs> to look awesome here. But as a coach, I'm trying to stay curious a little bit longer. And remember what I said before, which is like sometimes even if you know what the real problem is and you even have a good answer, it's not always the right thing to do to answer it. Mm. So how I answered it, and I used I used a habit. It's a, this is a kind of script that's in my head. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's a great question, and I'm definitely going to answer it because I've got some ideas. But before I tell you my idea, what's your first thought? And you're like, oh. Awkward. There's a little bit of silence, which, um, you know, to the listeners and maybe even to you, there's like, oh, my God, there's three seconds of silence so far. What's happening here? Um, but I was like, OK, I'm comfortable with silence. So I just let I just sat with the silence for a bit. And then you came up with two or three things. And I'm like, that's great. But then I asked one of the questions from the book. We call it the best coaching question in the world. I said, lovely. Great idea so far. And what else? What else could you do? And you're like, I've got nothing. And then you gave me two or three good ideas uh -huh. regardless. Right? Uh -huh. So um, now what that does is I'm like, you've done a great job. But if I wanted to, I can jump in and add just a little bit more and let me do that. So if you know that this is going to be difficult or awkward for a person, you could um, say to them, look, I've got a couple of questions I'm really keen to ask you. Here's what they are. Um, mm. And you email it to them before the meeting happens. Or in the meeting, just say to them, look, I can see I can see you're working hard on this, but you don't have an immediate question. Go away and think about it. And let's talk again in an hour or half an hour or half a day or tomorrow. And let me know what you've come up with in terms of an answer. And another is just to be quiet. <laughs> you know, let them work. Um, because sometimes what we make up as, oh, my goodness, they're under pressure and they don't have an answer is actually just somebody processing the question and having a think. And uh, they, they appreciate you giving them a little space and a little time to actually figure out what an answer might be. Well, that was masterfully ninja'd. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. and, and part of what I wanted uh, people to see is um, how being more coach-like can just feel like an everyday conversation. Mm -hmm. It's not like I went, oh, well, allow me to do some coaching right here, and I'm just putting on my coaching cloak and my coaching voice and my coaching mm. underwear. It's like, oh, look, that's a great question. Um, yeah. And, you know, I've got some thoughts, but what, what do you think? Yeah. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Even though I'm the interviewer here on this podcast, somehow <laughs> I'm now answering the question. How did that happen? <laughs> um, so, well, it was very that, gentle, too. That helps. Right. 
Mm. And, you know, it comes from um, I'm genuinely curious mm. and um, I'm not trying to make a big deal about it. And I'm also relaxed that if you said to me, I have no idea, you know, I'm really drawing a blank here. I'd be able to go, that's fine, uh, no problem. So here's some thoughts I've got. Mm -hmm. So I'm holding it lightly, but I've got a commitment in being more coach-like to help the other, to, to be lazy, be curious, and be often. I'm always looking for a chance to, can I ask a question here rather than give an answer? Hey guys, it's Ben. We're taking a quick break from Caitlin and Michael Bungay Senior to hear from one of you. This is Teresa Collins talking about what she learned was easier than she initially thought it was. Hi, Simplified Podcaster. I am coming to you from Evanston, Illinois. Something that I figured out was much simpler than I realized was making a really good-looking, good-tasting, not-at-all-sweaty lemon meringue pie. And the secret is patience. And really... Patience makes just about everything simpler, I think, from building a sandcastle to making a perfect meringue to even having a baby or living with a teenager or teaching teenagers. Um, patience really helps. It's harder to actually utilize it, but that's what I've learned. Love your podcast. Thanks. Thanks, Teresa. We'd love to hear from more of you out there. We're collecting a nice little batch. Let us know what you've learned was easier or simpler than you initially thought it was. Just record a voice memo and email it to us at podcast at Blinkist.com. All right, let's get back to the interview with Caitlin and Michael Bungay Stinger. So how did you how did you get to these seven questions in, in ten minutes? Did you spend more time in the past? How did you come up with this framework? Well, there's there's almost two questions there, so let me take them one by one. The first is, um, how did I come up with the ten minute thing? And that came from a frustration of looking at uh, coaching programs, some of which I'd been kind of hired to deliver, some of which I'd kind of in early attempts of my own to develop my own approach to thinking about coach training. And I just felt that most approaches for busy managers and leaders didn't take in the reality of their lives. And in fact, too much training felt like a, hey, well, here's our life coaching training course. Why don't we just add the word organization into it and then roll it out to executives or managers or leaders? Mm -hmm. So I started trying to be as manager centric as I could. And the question I asked was on the assumption that um, many managers would like to be more coach like because that will be useful for them and useful for for me. Um, what's the barrier to that stopping coaches being managers being more coach like? And, um, you know, it comes down to a bunch of things. I don't have time for this. I'm a bit weirded out by what coaching is. I don't really know what you're talking about. I kind of do, but I kind of don't. I don't want to be a coach. I, I, you know, I've met too many coaches and I don't want to be like that. Mm. And we, you know, we came up with ways of removing those concerns, 10 minutes or less. Here's what coaching is. It's simply be curious a little longer, rush to action and advice a little slower. We're not training you to be a coach. We want you to be a manager who's more coach-like. Hmm. And then as for the seven questions, um, you know, when I started, when I became a coach myself and I went through my training and you know, those early calls, I basically had my desk and my computer kind of covered in post-it notes all with questions written on them. Cause I'm like, you know, if I, if I panic, <laughs> I'll hmm. be able to look and, and pick a question. And then when I knew this book was kind of bubbling up, I went, okay, so how many questions am I going to share here? Because there's, you know, there's lots and lots of really good questions out in the world. And I wrote one version with like 163 questions and it was a terrible book. And then I went, okay, they're not that. So then I tried, experimented with three and then five and then nine. And in the end, you know, seven's got a vibe to it. There's a, it's got a, a pedigree, you know, the seven habits of something or others. Um, <laughs> and, and honestly, it just, it felt like seven felt like the right number. So uh -huh. it, there was a lot of pruning and adding and subtracting and fine tuning, but we kind of landed on these seven. Mm -hmm. What? So you talked about how you got to the seven questions, and but how did you get here? How did you get to do what you were doing? This is usually the kind of question I would ask you at the top of the uh, interview, but we just right. dove in. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, when people explain how they got here, it always sounds like a linear, thoughtful journey. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't typically buy that. There's a bunch of 
of stumbling around that got me here. Um, the metaphor I like comes from Jim Collins and one of his, it wasn't a good to great book, but it's, all of his books that sound kind of the same. Yeah. Um, and he, it was about, as he would put it, firing bullets and firing cannonballs. Mm. And his, the way this metaphor works is he says, look, when you're trying to figure out where to go uh, and you're not sure yet, you need to fire bullets. Bullets are kind of low risk uh, experiments. Mm -hmm. um, and you're trying to, you know, kind of use the bullets to kind of range find, to, to hit the target. But once you hit the target, you want to fire your cannonball. That's the kind of, okay, I've got it. Now I'm going to commit to it. And his observation is people either fire the cannonball too soon. Uh, you know, they're like, I've got this one idea. I'm, I'm putting every, I'm banking everything on it. Or they fire it too late. Mm. You know, they figure out what the thing is to do, but they don't quite have the courage to commit to it. So they keep their options open and it diminishes the impact that they might have. So in retrospect, I would say that there's been a fair degree of bullet firing. You know, I'm like, okay, I tried this out. Oh, I like this bit. I didn't like this bit. Um, okay, let me do more of that. Oh, okay, this is working. Oh, this isn't working. So, you know, in my past, I've done a law degree. I've done a master's degree in literature. I, I looked at becoming an academic and mm. realized I'd be a terrible academic. <laughs> I looked at being a lawyer and went, you know, I actually finished law school being sued by one of my law lecturers for defamation, so that wasn't going to work. Oh, whoops. Um, <laughs> so I was in the past. It was a good learning experience. Yeah. Um, I, I was an executive coach for a while, and then it turns out I got bored with just the only thing I did was coaching. Mm. Um, I spoke in front of crowds, and it turns out I love speaking in front of crowds, and I'm good at it, so do more of that. Uh, it turns out I'm really good at taking complex ideas and making them accessible and practical. So mm. you're know, creating content and intellectual property, and that led to book writing. And so it's been an accumulation of uh, well, it's a, been a process of shedding stuff that I've tried and has taught me stuff, but has made me not go, oh, maybe not that. And then kind of doubling down on the stuff that's really lit me up, like writing books, like speaking, yeah. like building this training company. Yeah. Great. The, the other thing I was going to ask you was, what do you love about this work? But I think you might have just answered that question. If you didn't, then then what do you love about this work? What gets you, what gets you <laughs> yeah. excited about it every day? Well, um, it, it has evolved. Um, the... I'm excited about the big picture, which is how do I give managers and leaders the skills to be more coach-like? Because when they're more coach-like, they get to be more human and the people, they get to be encouraged people who they're leading and influencing to be more human. Mm -hmm. um, and to, and what I mean by that in essence is helping them make braver choices, uh, to, to accept that they have a life where their life is shaped by the choices they make and to make bolder, braver choices. So I've got a big, a big kind of personal and corporate mission mm -hmm. that I get lit up by and I'm still excited by. Mm -hmm. And then the job itself, you know, it has evolved. So when I started Box of Crayons, it was me and I was off and I was facilitating and I love facilitating. Um, but now we run three to 400 programs a year and it would kill me to try and <laughs> deliver 400 programs a year. Right. My job has shifted from being the kind of guy with his fingers and all the pies and creating most of the stuff to trusting others to do that, but to play a role of coaching and nurturing and setting a vision and that sort of stuff. So, you know, part of what I love about this is it keeps me growing as a person. Yeah. So across your, your innovation and creativity and, and consulting and coaching projects, what's, what's something that you've learned is actually a lot simpler than you initially thought it was? Um, uh, you know, most things <laughs> are, more simple, <laughs> are simpler than you, than you think they are. You know, you don't actually need more information. You just need to start doing something to mm -hmm. figure it out. Uh, you know, most things uh, can be looked at through a few simple questions. You know, mm -hmm. should I say yes to this? Should I say no to this? If I said yes to this, would it take me closer to my goal or further away from my goal? Mm -hmm. um, what it means to show up as a good human being in this world. It's like be, be generous, um, be courageous, <laughs> make mm. the best choices you can. Um, it's like, what are the principles? What are the, what's the fundamental question that you're wrestling with? Mm -hmm. So yeah, getting to that, that core question, 
instead of yeah. letting yourself believe that it's a big hairy issue. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think we <laughs> that's a definitely a temptation. Um and and that's not to say things aren't complex. I mean, you know, uh so three days ago I hit this cool milestone, which is um randomly I, I decided I asked myself on the streetcar, I was going to the theater with my my wife, I was like how much of my life have I been with Marcella? You know, what percentage? Mm. So I called up a little app and I went, okay, calculate how many days I've been alive. And I was like, okay, 18,200 days. I'm about to turn 50. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, that's cool. So what? let me calculate how many days have passed since my first date with Marcella. It was back in 1992. Wow. And, uh, and, and it turned out it was 9,101 days. In other words, on the exact day that my life tipped over from less than half than more than half of my life with Marcella, I, I chose to calculate it. So it was a wow. really cool moment. Yeah, it was cool. That's really and, lovely. Well, thank you. I thought it was, I don't know, this is one of those, one of those cool moments. Where I was like, wow, what a good day to actually ask myself that question. And the, it is complex living with another person and it's complex being a person you know um because it's not like you pull a push a button or you pull a lever and a thing happens it's a much more complicated system than that Mm -hmm. but one of the things that to know about complexity is complexity is governed by principles rather than rules Hmm. Um, what do you mean by that yeah so the, the model, I can't remember where I got this model from, but basically says everything has one of three different forms. It's either simple, complicated, or complex. Simple is bake a cake. You mm-hmm. know, it's like follow these five instructions. Add flour to water to egg to milk to butter. <laughs> blend it all up. Mm-hmm. Put it in the oven for this heat at this time, and you get a cake. Mm-hmm. Complicated is like a bigger version of that you know Mm -hmm. and the example i've seen is launching a space shuttle you know it's enormous amount of spreadsheets involved in launching a space shuttle but if you follow all the instructions you'll basically get a space shuttle up into the into orbit Mm -hmm. complex is like a relationship or a flock of birds and, uh, you know, when you see a flock of birds, one of those swirling flocks of sparrows or starlings. Yeah, it's a murmuration. Um, yeah, exactly. Love that word, murmuration. You know, nobody has a list of to-dos taped onto the underside of their wing. They're, they're operating off three core principles. Um, fly as close as you can to the other birds. Fly towards the center. Don't run into any of the other birds. Mm. And that, those three rules are what create those amazing shapes of the, of the murmuration, of the, the swirling thousands and thousands of birds flying together. Mm. So we live, in, we, we live complex lives, but once you understand what the principles are that govern that, govern that life, you get to focus on how do I li- do my best job at living to those principles. That was a great answer. I think that you you just really you touched upon one of my favorite natural phenomena. So I mean, it was it was easy from then on out. Perfect. Um, so to close this out, I wanted to ask you a little bit about books and reading and what you've been reading and what's been what's been inspirational to you. Um, what are some foundational books that you've read that you would recommend to someone who wants to be able to do more great work, for example? Mm. You know, there's a lot of great books out there. Um, and so much of it depends on who you are and what lights you up. But books that have influenced me include uh, Bill Bryson's book called A Short History of Nearly Everything, which is really kind of making science cool and accessible and amazing. And for me, the impact is going, it is amazing. <laughs> it's a miracle that I am alive on this planet at this time. Mm-hmm. So make the most of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Adam Grant's book, Give and Take, is really interesting because it gives you a way of understanding how to show up and be generous in the world in a way that uh, nourishes you rather than diminishes you. Mm. And well, this is a good book. Um, if you're interested in kind of some of the kind of principles around the coaching piece, mm-hmm. there's an academic called uh, Edgar Schein, Ed Schein, mm. C-S-C-H-E-I-N. Yep. And uh, his book is called, this has got a combination of books, it's called Helping and Humble Inquiry, mm, which yeah. cast great light on why it's so hard to help people and how to think about 
being helpful in a way that serves them rather than just serves you. Mm-hmm. Mm. So I don't really think there's anything Perfect. else that I, I need to to wrap this up. Perfect. Okay, great talking with you. Thanks so much. You too, Kate. All right, have a good one. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Welcome to the bookend, where we end with books. So, that was a cool interview. Yeah. He was such a nice guy. He is such a nice guy. That was a a very gentle interrogation of me, which I was not expecting. Yeah, he really turned it around on you with his, his coaching questions. It was like a live, you know, live coach. Live coach. Ninja moves. Ninja moves, indeed. Canadian ninja moves, totally flinging those iron maple <laughs> leaves of wisdom. So why did you want to talk to Stan Year for the season? Mm-hmm. Well, really, I like his method of leadership, how it puts the power into the hands of the person executing the task and leads them to make good decisions rather than demands they follow a program. Um, I think that more and more businesses are starting to run this way. The whole top-down thing just doesn't work anymore. Yeah, and we got to the bottom of it, I think. I mean, I think we cut through the buzz. I think you did a really good job of like clarifying in the interview why these questions work. Oh, thanks, Ben. So, yeah, so the whole top-down thing doesn't really work anymore. And I think what was cool, we talked about it the, in the intro, there's so many books out there about coaching, but how do we get to the bottom of it? And I, I like how you guys really narrowed down like why these questions are powerful, why just why we give too much advice. Mm, mm-hmm. So what stood out to you in the interview? Um, well, I think it was his emphasis on on cultivating two things. Curiosity, as in approaching a person or a challenge, you know, whatever, with curiosity rather than an agenda. And what he refers to as laziness or leaning back and taking it slowly. Jumping to conclusions less quickly, allowing for ideas to develop and breathe. I really, that stuck with me from talking to him. Okay, so let's get to the books. You picked out, you picked out three, right? Yeah, I did. So the first one is Humble Inquiry. And I think the subtitle of this book says it all. It's The Gentle Art of Asking Instead of Telling. I read this one a couple of years ago, actually, and it really changed my whole approach on giving feedback. I use what I learned here, what Shine calls diagnostic uh, inquiry and ways to fold my own theories where appropriate into a question in order to become a better editor. What's, um, can you give like a specific example of this diagnostic inquiry? Yeah, um... So, for example, the way that I used it when I was editing in G-Docs, because where else would you edit? Um, instead of whenever I caught myself saying, how about X, I would instead rephrase it to say, what if we, why? Have you thought about or can you tell me more about this idea? Rather than, I think you should do X, it becomes more about like, tell me about your thinking, what led you here? Yeah. What do you think Instead of... Instead of just saying, here's what you should do. Yeah. Just saying like, what do you think of X? What do you think of Y? Why don't we try talking about X here? So it becomes a conversation rather than a set of orders. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I don't know that book. I have to check that one out. It's really good. I definitely recommend it. Okay. Mm-hmm. What else you got? All right. I also have A Short History of Nearly Everything. So That's in, the, Bill, the Bill Bryson book, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. In the interview, Michael says that this book gave him a keen appreciation for how <laughs> incredible it is that he's alive in this moment, in this geographic place, living this specific life. Yeah, I like the one I always remember from this book. In the Big Bang, matter expanded so rapidly that the entire universe formed within the time it might take you like to make a sandwich or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You may or may not take the same appreciation away from this book, but one way or another, what you will get is a crash course on all the major existential questions of life. Do you think, slight side note, do you think that like being a good leader, you also have to have other interests other than business also, or like other than work? Because you know how he's saying like he has a law degree, Mm. he's like got a master's in literature. And when Mm -hmm. I think about some of the good leaders that I work with, they also, they have like passions, they Mm -hmm. have, and they, they tend to see work in perspective also. I completely agree with that. Yeah. Because if a leader brings their whole self with their idiosyncrasies and interests and personality to the job, then that frees the employees or the the trainees or the mentees or whatever to do that too. And that only creates, I think, a better environment in which to get work done because you connect on a personal level rather Mm -hmm. than um, just a work bot level. And I mean- it work also bot. <laughs> work bot. It also <laughs> takes some of the pressure off of interacting only in a work way. Yeah, and I think puts work, as you said, in perspective. Yeah, th- I think that's definitely true. That's interesting. That's cool. Work bot. Okay. So <laughs> what, what else? What one more book? All right, last one. Uh, this one is the Silent Language of Leaders by Carol Kinsey Goman. So. 
The thing that struck me while talking with Michael is that asking questions the way that he suggests requires a lot of awareness of what you're saying and how you're framing questions, of course, but carrying all of that off really demands that you have an exquisitely high awareness of your own body language, how you're coming off to the person you're coaching. Yeah, it's and it's more than like a self-awareness of like, oh crap, I'm slouching again, but also like, how can I use this in a way that's most effective? So yeah. what's, can you give like a, like a, another specific example of this? Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the things that I read in this book was about, and this is the thing that I think a lot of people know instinctively mm-hmm. when you're talking with someone, you want to connect, you want to leave your body open, your shoulders back, your legs facing toward them. Crossing your legs is okay if the other person is crossing their legs, but it's good to, um, to create a better empathetic connection. It's good to lean toward them. It's good to tilt your head the way they do. But the most important thing is that you demonstrate to them by giving them open body language facing toward them that you have given them all of your attention and what they're saying to you matters. Mm-hmm. Have you ever been in like a interview or a meeting where somebody's mirroring your body language too much? Oh, yes. It's kind of weird. And it was really obvious. It was actually a Tinder date. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. Well, those are, that's an amazing book. So we have The Silent Language of Leaders by Carol Kinsey Goman. We have A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson. Shout out to The Big Bang. And we have Humble Inquiry by Joseph Schein. Shout out to sandwiches. <laughs> Shout out to the universe. <laughs> Then that's great. That's such a cool, such a cool list of like diverse interests, body language, asking questions. Yeah. That's cool. I feel like that list aligns really well with Michael as an interviewee. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Then let's, um, let's get into the credits. Cool. Thanks for listening to this episode of Simplify. It was produced by me, Benjamin Stoller, Caitlin Schiller, Nat Daroshkina, Ben Jackson, and Odie Constantino, who makes his own chairs out of materials he finds at the farmer's market. Ooh, intriguing. All right, so if you enjoyed this episode or feel that you learned something cool, could you please do us a favor and send it to one person you like? (laughs) Especially if this person would particularly get something out of this. Just send it to one person. Spread the word. We really want to, to have more people get in touch with us and to hear what we're doing over here. So yeah, send it to one person. We'd really appreciate it. And yeah, a big shout out already to the people who subscribe to us on Google Play, Overcast, Apple Podcasts, Stitchers, uh, Pocket Cast, wherever you listen. And uh, if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to add a review or a rating or a star or a heart or a thumb or a face or whatever, we'd be really appreciative. It helps us. Helps us Fire emojis, out. also fine. <laughs> yeah. All right. We want to also remind you guys that you can tweet at us. Uh, I'm at Bisto, B-S-T-O, and you're at... At Caitlin Schiller. So last thing, maybe you already know this, maybe you don't, but Simplify is made by the same people who make Blinkist. Blinkist, if you don't know, is a learning app that takes the world's best-selling nonfiction books, like The Coaching Habit, and condenses them into these focused little capsules of knowledge available in audio or text that you can listen to or read in just about 15 minutes. Right. And we made another uh, voucher code for this episode. You can get 14 days free if you go to Blinkist.com slash friends and type in the voucher code COACHLESS. C O A C H L E S S. Mm-hmm. Coach less. Although you could also think of it as coach less, like mm-hmm. don't coach so much, mm-hmm. which is the message, I think, one of the messages that we were trying to get from this interview. Yeah. So clever, Ben. Thanks. <laughs> um, meanwhile, thanks so much for sending in voice memos about the answer to the question, What have you learned? was much easier than you thought it was. Mm. If you haven't done it yet, record a voice memo and email it to me and Caitlin at podcast at blinkist.com. Or just let us know a good coaching experience you have. That's cool, too. Yeah, we love to hear good stories like that. All right, so we'll be back next week with another episode of Simplify. And in the meantime, be awesome. This is Caitlin. And Ben. Check Check it out. out. See you guys. Bye. Bye.